Hi everyone. So today I want to talk to you about our new newsletter which is going to be released today at uh, 1 p.m. UK time. So be on the lookout for this. And it's focused on um, whether at the moment the current legal framework in the music industry forces artists to actually hand out songwriting credits to competitor musicians. So it's, an art, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite an in-depth article, but at the same time it's quite funny, it's quite quirky because I have included all these, um, all these uh, basically music tracks to show you uh, what I mean by giving you a definition of sampling, by giving you a definition of interpolation, and uh, and also by explaining to you, you know, where there are some borderline cases in terms of uh, copyright infringement, uh, uh, etc., and where also the um, current case law stands, um, in particular from a U.S. law standpoint, because most of these big stakes uh, legal cases are actually trialed in California most of the time. And uh, uh, prominently, the uh, Ninth Secret Court of Appeal of the state of California comes over and over and back over and over, uh, having to take, you know, some decisions on all these cases. So, on, in a nutshell, in relation to this topic, whether um, in this, the current music ecosystem, artists have to hand out songwriting credits, um, the first point is actually to uh, 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 speak about the um, landmark case in relation to sampling, uh, which uh, was the O'Sullivan versus J. Sharkey. I think the rapper was called J. Sharkey, or B. Sharkey, um, back in 1991. So O'Sullivan was an Irish... Um, performer, quite famous, I think, in the 70s and the 80s, and he released a track, a song called Alone Again, Naturally, and Jay Sharkey, in a very cheeky way, uh, also uh, released a song called Alone Again, and then he goes, Alone Again, Naturally. So, O'Sullivan, who uh, had not been contacted prior to the release of B. Charkey's uh, track Al Alone Again, filed a lawsuit in the US against B. Charkey because he um, deemed that um, he alleged that um, B. Charkey had actually uh, lifted, um, i.e., uh, infringed on uh, his uh, copyright in relation to, well, first the lyrics, alone again, naturally, and also on uh, some portions uh, some portions of a music composition, uh, which are repeated in a loop in the J. Sharkey Alone Again track. And actually the US court gave, uh, uh, basically gave reason to, uh, to O'Sullivan and um, decided that from now on, samplers, so songwriters who make common use of sampling and samples in, um, in the new, uh, in the new um, uh, songs, uh, need to obtain the prior consent from the, um, from the original songwriter and, um, and also owner of the... Um, master recording of the uh, of a sample that they uh, they want to use and to uh, insert in their track so let me just take a step back here and explain to you the difference between copyright on um, music composition and uh, copyright on uh, on the masters in music law there are two types of copyright there's the copyright which belongs to the songwriters, the lyricists and uh, the publishers, which is on the, on the musical composition and the lyri lyrics. And that is called usually the publishing rights. 
The second copyright is the copyright which is allocated to the owner of a sound recording. So when you record the track, right, it creates a sound recording. And so there's copyright on that. And um, the uh, copyright on the sound recording usually belongs to the performer, obviously, who performs the track, as well as um, the label, because the label just produced everything. And so that is called the master, the, the master copyright, the, um, yeah, the copyright on the masters. So when you sample, you use an actual uh, existing sound recording, which is based on some lyrics and uh, some musical composition created by some lyricists as well as some uh, uh, songwriters. So you need to clear two licenses. You need to obtain two licenses from the owners of the uh, publishing copyright as well as the owners from the master copyright. So obviously when this landmark ruling uh, was handed down back in 1991 on the O'Sullivan v. Sharkey case, this created like a, a, uh, a massive, you know, uh, tide of, uh, of uh, surprise, in, especially in the um, rap and uh, hip hop community, because um, uh, the, these artists use sampling a lot. They use a lot of samples in their, um, in their, uh, in their tracks, but not only, but um, uh, for example, uh, there's quite a lot of sampling also being used in, 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 in pop or electronic music, but in, in particular, uh, hip hop and rap um, musicians do use quite a lot of samples. And after the 1991 ruling, it became just too expensive most of the time to actually obtain some, um, some free clearance, some, some licenses for both the... Um, uh, the um, uh, songwriting as well as the uh, the masters. So, so some artists like Dr. Dre, for example, started using less and less uh, samples, just focusing the um, the new musical compositions on just one or two ch choice samples, the best samples, and then um, and then wor working on it with that because sometimes they were f confronted to they were confronted to um, songwriters, I mean writer knows, who are asking them for even sometimes 100% of a credit. So when you say 100% of a credit, it means you guys who are creating my, uh, my, uh, uh, this new song using my sample, you're not going to get any uh, publishing rights. I'm going to get 100%. And some very prominent artists like um, Bob Dylan and the Rolling Stones in particular are famous for doing this. Yeah, they're taking either 100% or in the case of Bob Dylan, I think he, he, uh, he, he negotiated 50% of the, uh, of the uh, publishing rights, which, which is a lot, a lot. But then they're like, yeah, but you're using the prestige, you know, of Bob Dylan, you're using the prestige of uh, Rolling Stones, so your song is going to become a hit thanks to that, so, you know, you should thank us and uh, not the other way around. So, okay, so basically, coming back to Dr. Dre, what he did as well, is that he started doing a lot of interpolation. So what is interpolation? It's the, the use of um, only the sound recording and lyrics of a particular extract, a particular um, sample, a particular extract, but not the sound recording. So I repeat, it's the use of the lyrics and the... Um, did I say the song recording? I, I, I said incorrectly. The use of the lyrics and the uh, musical composition of a particular song, but not the sound recording. So if you do that, if you do interpolation, therefore you only have to secure a license with the, um, with, for the publishing rights, i.e. with the songwriters and the publishers. So that's less expensive because you don't have to ask a license to the, master, to the owners of the master recording. And so interpolation became quite a thing um, after the 1991 landmark ruling I just mentioned. And for example, Eminem in his, uh, in his famous track, you know, Sound Shady, um, he actually used an interpolation from another track uh, 
I mean, do look up uh, 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 my article and you will be able to click on the link and see exactly what I mean. It's pretty plain when, and, and clear when you, when you read the article. But uh, Eminem, who actually was produced by Dr. Dre, um, used in one of his uh, biggest and uh, earliest hits, this uh, technique of interpolation to a lot of success. So things were, to a degree, pretty clear on how it used to work in the uh, you know music clearance business up to the bloodline case oh and by the way there were so, some hurdles along the way for example the uh, bittersweet symphony case um, which is the verve against uh, the rolling stones so what happened there in 1993 richard ashcroft a successful frontman of the verve and as well as songwriter and uh, singer um, created a, a, a bittersweet symphony, the aptly named bittersweet symphony, um, in which he actually sampled an extract from a very famous hit of the Rolling Stones. Um, it was a, basically a reprise of this, uh, of this hit from the Rolling Stones by uh, the Andrew Luce, Andrew Luce uh, Orchestra or something. So it goes, dun, 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 the bittersweet symphony. But anyway, so there is a, a famous sample from uh, from uh, the Rolling Stones in there. And um, some other samples had uh, been put into the Bittersweet Symphony, but it didn't really work out. So they actually went back to the original idea with this um, sample from uh, from the Rolling Stones interpretation by Andrew Luce. And what happened is that, you know, the, the record on which the Bittersweet Symphony had to be released was about to was about to come out, right? So, oh, and then they think, oh, by the way, we need to actually, you know, clear a license with the Stones, with Keith Richards and Mick Jagger, who are the songwriters for, for this particular, for this particular big hit that they uh, they lifted in the Bittersweet Symphony. And so, due to timing issues and them, not uh, you know, the Verve's management not really anticipating anything, they went at the eleventh hour to the Stones, and in particular to the. Stone's manager, Alan Klein, I think, at the time, and the guy just did them over big time. Why? Because he actually asked on behalf of uh, Jagger and uh, Richards 100% of the, of the song, of the publishing rights. So up until two years ago, I think 2019, Richard Ashcroft had zero, zero publishing royalties in relation to his uh, massive success, Bittersweet Symphony. Two years ago, what happened is that Richards and, uh, and Jagger finally came to their senses, you know, at last, realizing that what they did was just fucked up. And they actually uh, transferred the uh, ownership of the songwriting um, back to uh, Richard Ashcroft, you know, allegedly as set out in a lot of articles. So anyway, as I was saying, there were quite a lot of hurdles along the road, as I just explained with this uh, bittersweet symphony case, which was indeed very bitter for Mr. Ashcroft. Uh, but, but, I mean, all in all, things were clear. You had to actually do pre-clearance before issuing the track if you were using some sampling uh, with the um, owners of the, of the um, musical composition and, and lyrics, as well as the... Um, owners of the sound recordings, if you are using a sample, and with the owners of the songwriting and, uh, sorry, of, of the musical composition and the lyrics in, in case you were using interpola inter interpolation. And things actually changed dramatically with a bloodline case, which was concluded in 2018, if I remember well. So what happened there? As we all know, because it was still very recent in our memory, Pharrell Williams, Robin Fick, and T.I. released back in 2000, uh, I think it was 14, 13, 14, Bloodlines, which was a massive success. And um, immediately the uh, estate and family of Marvin Gaye, the um, songwriter on Got to Give It Up, um, started making some public allegations that the song Bloodlines uh, infringed on the copyright of uh, the Marvin Gaye estate um, in relation to Got to Give It Up, 
the song Got to Give It Up. So, annoyed by these claims, um, which seemed pretty um, unsubstantiated at the time, because uh, perhaps Bloodlines has got a similar, like a, like a, 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 a similar feel, a similar groove, um, a, a similar, you know, yeah, feel to um, uh, Got to Give It Up, but no no uh, musical composition, no lyrics are the same at all. Um, even the sound recording sounds different. So it seemed pretty insubstantiated, these claims that uh, there was any um, uh, copyright infringement in this particular s situation. So the three songwriters of uh, Blurred Lines, Pharrell Williams, Robin Thicke and T.I., the rapper, um, actually um, filed a lawsuit, again in California, in order to obtain a preliminary judgment which um, confirmed that there, were, there was no infringement. Unfortunately for them, the, uh, the court and the judge in particular found for the defendants of so the Marvin Gaye family, the Gaye family, and said that um, the defendants had uh, provided enough, uh, um, enough um, elements uh, uh, evidencing that there was indeed some uh, some uh, alleged some potential infringement of copyright in this matter, so on this on this and since also the gay family uh, filed some counterclaims, the um, the case proceeded to trial, and the um, jury handed down its uh, verdict, uh, by which it actually found. Pharrell Williams and uh, Robin Thicke, not T.I., those two ones, of songwriters only, Thicke and Williams, uh, liable for um, infringement. So infringement of a groove, of, of a feel. This is just like... Um, so it's, it's usually you say that copyright is the um, protection of tangible output from creativity. It's not... Um, copyright is not the protection of an idea. But in this particular case, it's extremely borderline, as you can see. I mean, how can you say this copyright on the groove, on the feel? It's just unbelievable. So anyway, the jury verdict found for uh, the gay family and allocated, uh, awarded them $7.3 million of damages and, and profits, which is massive uh, in view of this case. And um, of course, uh, the three songwriters for Bloodlines appealed. And in appeal, the um, damages were reduced to $5.3 million, but still, the jury verdict was actually affirmed by the um, Ninth Court of Appeal, uh, Ninth Secret Court of Appeal of California. And, and that's that, really. And so in 2018, the case was finalized, and um, Fick and uh, Williams had to pay $5.3 million to the uh, gay state, uh, which actually sued Robert Williams, uh, no, sorry, Farrow Williams for, I think, perjury or something, but that failed. It was rejected by the, uh, by the, by the judge, found that uh, they couldn't uh, bring any um, appropriate evidence of uh, uh, Williams of perjury in court, and, um, and that was that. But this particular case, this particular ruling, blurred lines, really sent a shockwave through the um, for the music industry because then it meant that everybody could come at you and say oh by the way your, your new track here which is a hit well it's actually you know a copy of uh, the groove and the feel in my song from like the uh, 1970s or something and this is happening this is what is happening at the moment but uh, every time that there is you know a song which becomes a hit you got potentially a raft of uh, competitors uh, performers, songwriters coming, knocking at the door and saying, hey, hand, hand out a credit here because you copied my groove, you copied my feel. And so, I mean, of course, in these cases, which are called fair use cases, okay, so uh, fair use as in, do, am I using this particular uh, extract this particular sample in fair use or so these cases so this is fair use is a concept under common law um, and in the US um, it's pretty much it's used quite a lot in these uh, music music uh, you know litigation cases and so on these fair use cases fair use cases 
um, they are decided on a case by case basis. Okay, so there's no. Um, the, the, the outcome is not known at the beginning. It depends on the evidence which is shown during the, uh, the trial, during the, uh, during yeah, during the trial. During, it, it depends on the testimony. Dep testimony is given during the, uh, the court hearings. Um, so that's why it's called case by case basis. Yes, and there are two big lawsuits which came after the uh, bloodline case, which show that. You know, it, it, it's not, it's not a basically, um, a, a, you know, a free for all. Like, it's not now that the, that the new, sorry, legal framework in the music industry is not um, anyone can come at you and claim a music credit. Um, these two cases I'm going to talk about just basically toned down the effect of the bloodline cases and so these are the Katy Perry versus Page uh, sorry Page versus Katy Perry et al case which relates to um, some allege allegations of um, copyright infringement on, uh, on uh, of, of the song Dark Horse which was uh, released by uh, Katy Perry in the uh, a few years ago in the around probably around 2015-16 and there is a ostinato, so do, 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 do. so that's an ostinato. Okay, it's like a musical term which has been going on, you know, for ages since the Renaissance, really, even even probably before. And so this do, 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 is used throughout the track in Dark Horse um, as a bass, really, as a, so it comes back and then back and in a loop. And there's a, a sort of Christian band. Uh, called Flame, um, which approached Perry and the team and said, hey, you lifted that ostinato from actually our track, um, I can't remember the name of the track, which basically had uh, 300 views on SoundCloud before this, um, before they filed um, some summons against Perry. So um, Perry said that to her that she had never heard that they track, obviously, since I've done that 300 views and then this, and the... Uh, 300 clicks on SoundCloud, and so they sued um, a Flame, this Christian group. But um, uh, again, the uh, the courts in California uh, looked at this case, and they decided that the two-part uh, test was uh, showed that there were there were basically the uh, Flame couldn't make couldn't show that um, that uh, Perry had had access to their music, firstly, and also that uh, this particular ostinato do, 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 had enough um, originality to be deemed to be protected by copyright. Why? Because it's been, as I said, used by um, um, uh, songwriters and musical composers um, throughout the ages for you know hundreds of years and and um, and centuries. So. On the back of that, even though the jury verdict found for the claimants, for, for, for Sage and for, for, for the group Flame, for the band Flame, um, the judge who um, looked into the case after the jury verdict, you know, um, decided that uh, no, penalty, no, no, no damages were due uh, 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 by Pet Perry and the team to, um, to Flame because they couldn't, the, uh, the claimants couldn't prove um, the um, originality of this uh, ostinato being protected by copyright, so they, it was not protected by copyright, and also because um, the defendants did not have access to their music before the um, before the uh, uh, the um, a lawsuit. So that was that case on um, uh, Dark Horse, just turned down the um, message um, projected out there by the Bloodline case. And then there was the um, Stairway to Heaven case, whereby <clears throat> the uh, estate of, um, what was the name of this guy? Can't remember. So the estate of a, um, a guy who had uh, 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 wrote a song called Taurus. And they had open actually for the, um, for the, um, 
of a band, um, Led Zeppelin, back in the 70s, this particular band. And um, so, uh, so the case was basically that um, uh, the song from this, uh, this band um, was Taurus, um, had been infringed by Jimmy Page and Robert Plant, the songwriters for uh, Led Zeppelin, in the very famous track Stairway to Heaven. So it's basically the ta na 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 So it's, you know. And um, listen to those two tracks. There are there are actually some URL links to, um, to those two tracks on, on YouTube in my article, which is going to be, as I said, released by Worth Newsletter and social media this afternoon. And, um, and yeah. And so, again, same outcome than in Dark Horse, the, uh, the, um, the US court, which had been uh, asked to look at this matter, decided against the claimant, uh, founding that they uh, didn't have any substantial evidence um, showing that there was uh, some um, real similarities between this, the, 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 the particular extract of a track from the Taurus uh, com compared to the um, extract from the track Stairway to Heaven, and that was that. Um, the, it went up to the Supreme Court because they appealed and appealed and appealed again, the claimants, but uh, without success. Yeah, I think the guy was called Randy something. Randy, get, Randy something, yeah, so the estate of Randy, whatever. He was called in, um, in the public domain Randy California. So, um, therefore, even though the bloodline case was toned out, toned down by the outcomes in the Dark Horse and um, and uh, uh, um, uh, Stairway to Heaven case, says, um, today, the fact is that so many successful artists um, are being, you know, um, sued in court for, uh, uh, for uh, alleged copyright infringement, because now if you can sue for <laughs> uh, infringement on the, on the sound, on the feel, and there is basically no limit to, um, to your um, basically uh, counterfeit allegation claims. So, so, yeah. And one young artist, she's just 11 years old, and she released her first debut album, therefore, uh, very successfully in May 2021, Sour. Her name is Olivia Rodrigo. She's from the US, California. And she's been confronted to this situation. She really released really some mega hits, in particular the, the tracks Deja Vu and uh, um, For You, I think it's called Be For You or There For You. And there were some basic discussions on the internet saying, well, yeah, she lifted this part and that part and that and that sound and that feel and that groove from, um, you know, um, um, uh, Morrissey, Van, uh, Morrissey and also from Taylor Swift and also from Paramore. And so her, her uh, she's only 18 years old and she, so she's a very successful songwriter as well as performer. So she's writing her own songs. She's doing very well. I mean, her songs I've played so many times in KCRW, for example, this um, California um, radio station I listen to and songs are daily uh, played on, a, on, on KCRW like as an example of her success and so basically when she actually read all this stuff on the internet TikTok and stuff well she her and the team actually started handing out credits songwriting credits to um, Taylor Swift because the allegations were that Deja Vu um, was um, very close to uh, Taylor Swift hit A Cruel Summer, which Swift had written with uh, uh, St. Vincent, the other musician St. Vincent. So she, handing, she handed out, you know, songwriting credits on her song, uh, Deja Vu, to um, St. Vincent and, um, and um, Taylor Swift, just to quash, you know, allegation, any allegations of, um, of copyright infringement. And she did the same with um, the, the front woman of Paramore, as well as an ex-band member who had uh, written one of a song of Paramore, which allegedly was very similar to um, There For You, I think it's called the um, Olivia Rodrigo 
uh, track, she did the same. She also uh, hand out some uh, um, uh, songwriting credit to them. And so at the moment, the music industry is just crashing their head and thinking, is that the way forward? Like every time you have someone coming out of a woodwork saying, well, you copied my feel, my copied the, my, my groove in this particular song, you just hand, hand out some songwriting credits. Well, I would say as an entertainment lawyer that it depends. It depends, um, firstly, if the allegations are founded and um, strong. It depends also if you as a... Um, as an artist, you have, you know, the, uh, the backbone to actually withstand um, the, the costs and the, the time and the energy that one has to put if um, a, a copyright infringement case goes to, uh, you know, to full-blown litigation, goes to trial. And um, it also depends on, you know, the perception and the reputation you want to put out there for yourself with, in the public domain. Do you want to be seen as someone who's got principle and is not going to budge? Do you want to be seen as someone who is cool and understanding? I mean, you know, you know what I mean. So, and also it depends on your mental health. Some people just can't, can't do it, right? Um, so, um, so in the case of Olivia Rodrigo, this is how she decided to um, resolve the issues and uh, quash all the allegations of copyright infringement. And um, Ed Sheeran, for example, has so many cases uh, uh, you know, filed against him by some obscure bands <laughs> coming out of the woodwork saying that this and that was lifted from their uh, own songs, which usually have miserable, miserably low uh, number of views on, uh, on Spotify or SoundCloud, uh, etc. But, um, and so therefore he gets embroiled in um, very long and protracted uh, lawsuits, but he doesn't seem to actually want to, you know, um, to give to, to hand out um, songwriting credits um, at Chirin. So every artist has got a different strategy. Um, Rodrigo is only 18 years of age, and um, you know, new in the industry, uh, she decided to hand it in a quite flexible and um, and uh, cool, so to speak, way. Um, so yeah, um, litigation or songwriting credits—that is the question. Bye for now.